Hey guys, welcome to another episode of This Is My Story. I'm super excited today that I have one of my best friends in the studio with me, Andy Finch in the house. Guys, from California, Lake yep. Tahoe. Andy Finch is a pro snowboarder, been a pro snowboarder for over 20 years, retired now. God's just using him in so many ways, and he loves his story. He's got a phenomenal story, but I think it's going to catch you off guard in so many ways that is going to encourage you for you to be able to see that your story matters. Your story has value because that's why we're here. We're here to jumpstart that passion for our own story in the gospel to get us excited about something. Why? Because A, we need it, but B, the world needs it. People are longing for a connection with God, and I truly believe they're going to find it in our stories. So I hope you're going to be encouraged today. Before we dive in, there's two sponsors. Thank God for them providing support for this podcast, Word of Life Bible Institutes. You. you know all about them. Love you guys. We're going to talk about you guys even in this podcast, Andy and I and Sean, Mary, Matt Mazzari. We all just went up there and had a blast. Even Emily, my wife, uh, took our kids to snow camp. God is good. We love Word of Life, Bible Institute, and the camps. So check them out. There'll be a link down below, and uh, we'll link a commercial that we did together up there in New York and uh, talk a little bit about that in this episode. Also, Christian Healthcare Ministries. I've said this before. They're not a health care insurance, but they are a health care provider that is alternative to insurance. I would highly recommend you check out the link below in the description because you can find out more about how to get cost-affordable um, biblical solution for your health care. And um, so find out more about that. Save money. Start today. Become a member. And uh, without any further ado, my friend, welcome to the show. Yeah, Kevin, thank you so much for having me. We've known each other for a while. We we met in um, 2009, I think, when I went out to California. We did your testimony. Yes. Did not know each other prior to that. Cold slice of turkey right there. Yeah. Just came out. Your wife, call. your wife. We were just talking about last night because you guys are staying with us. We were talking about how awkward that was at first as your wife was, was it like, awkward well slightly i mean no you guys made everything feel good but she was kind of asking a lot of questions about you know how does this ministry work and who is who anyone that meets you kevin's like they're gonna ask a lot of questions true but uh <laughs> yeah man that was a great experience and major story your story is really powerful i'm looking forward to diving into it not my story it's god's story hey what he's doing well yeah start us out um obviously uh snowboarding was massive part of your life and your career yeah i mean i think for someone to understand a little bit about my career and my mindset uh you kind of go back to when i was three years old my aunt doe as i called her or aunt dawn uh, taught me how to climb fences and the cool thing is i climbed started climbing fences i'm like oh you jump off you can kind of fly for a second uh, and then I'm like, well you climb a little higher you can fly a second longer so i started jumping off roofs and out of trees and uh, something, you know, and then it, water, wakeboarding. Uh, but when snowboarding came along, I felt like you could fly a little bit longer. And I think snow was just so soft and yeah, you could feel like you could, I don't know, a little bit of superhero status of, of being able to hit snow and kind of be okay. Like jumping off the roof, honestly, it hurt a little bit. Yeah. If I did it now, I would never get back up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and I, I watch you walk all the time. I feel, I feel like pain just watching you, you walk. Cause Thank it you. looks painful. You. It feels great. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> your, your career, uh, started out young, um, in the sport of snowboarding and you got into it. So walk us through what that life was like and yeah. take us through some highlights. It, everything I thought about, dreamt about, visualized, wanted to do was related to snowboarding at the age of 12. I first saw snowboarding at 10 and it really captivated me. Uh, I was at a pair of old garage sale skis strapped to my feet and I watched a snowboarder catch air where I'd never seen anyone catch air before and he made it look good. Mm. He, he was doing a method, the tail came around, we call that a grasser, some of us do anyways, and dad, that's what I wanted to do. But snowboarding at that time was, it was the bad boys, it was the rebels. Um, yeah. And Action sports, extreme sports was extreme kind of in people's mind. Yeah, like it was the young way they kids. Lived their life. And yeah. they just wanted to, they wanted the freedom. They wanted to rebel against establishment. And one thing that I really enjoyed about the early days of snowboarding, uh, actually a couple things. One was the freedom to kind of express yourself. And two uh, was the community. You know, one thing that really uh, drew me in, and I actually have a lot of appreciation for now, is because we were outcast, we were family. We had this strong bond and hold that connected us all. 
Uh, and if you didn't stick together, you're probably going to get beat up in the lift line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I saw a lot of fights go down in the lift line. Like people did not like having us on the hill. And so those guys that I rode with, they're still lifelong friends. I like that. The bond and the belonging. I was talking to Brian Sumner uh, on a couple episodes ago. He said the same thing. It was about family. I think in wakeboarding, it was about family. Yeah. I think in any, any team sport, it's about family. So we'll touch back on this a second later on. Because I, I want to talk to you and ask you a question about how the gospel brings about the greatest belonging. So mm. don't let me forget to talk about that. But let's uh, stick with your snowboarding for a second. Um, you got into snowboarding and half pipe was really kind of your main thing. So walk us through like what aspect of snowboarding you did in the competition scene. Well, I grew up in Central California where there was no snow industry. Like you go to Tahoe, Salt Lake... Um, Vermont, there's there's these, you know, Colorado, Breckenridge, Copper Mountain, there's or Denver, there's these hubs that have a lot of industry people around it. Central California had zero. We just had a little group of friends. But Tahoe wasn't that far. And when you watch the weather patterns, like I just watched the storm coming into all of California and then it would bottleneck and just tee up Tahoe and unload there and then we'd get the leftovers. So it was my dream to live in Tahoe. I wanted to be in a hub. I knew I needed to if I wanted to have a career. And, but it really started just on an amateur level. Some of the local people, um, you know, Alan and Michelle Armstrong really took me under their wing. They ran the local series. They helped progress me. Like here's, they helped me get points so that I could go to nationals. I eventually won to nationals. I got my first couple sponsors. Then that opened up the door to do junior worlds. And then junior world, finally won junior worlds. That opened up my first couple of professional sponsors. And then that went into uh, being on the pro circuit. You know, about that time, I'm graduating high school, living on the road, uh, which also plays into a lot of my story of where, uh, you know, growing up knowing about God and knowing the stories of the Bible, but never having a relationship with God. I knew the stories, kind of did some of the routine, but I wasn't, I wasn't reading, I wasn't praying. And the opportunity to try out the things that the world says are going to make you happy um, I took it. I said, all right, this is how the world's, my friends are doing it. My peers are doing it. Let's try it out. And, you know, at the moment, I think I liked the things. It was things that seemed fun and kind of, you get this carefree attitude. I don't care. I don't care about others. And it only took about three, four years of that lifestyle to all of a sudden, and I praise the Lord for this, that he opened my eyes mm. Uh, to the damage and destruction I was doing, not only to myself, but to my loved ones, to people I cared about. Um, I, yeah, I left a path of destruction. Yeah, And I'm like, this this isn't worth it. This is not working out. The things I love are destroying me and leaving me emotionally ripped apart to the mm. point where I was, I was broken and, and I was in tears, punching the ground. I was in so much frustration. Like, God... This isn't my way's not working. And I knew that I was being disobedient to God's word. And, you know, I thought all these laws and stuff were just going to make me unhappy. And like, why do I want to do it? God, that's not fun. Uh, but one thing, so, so through prayer and like, God, I'm ready to try it your way. Let's, let's, let's just try it. I wasn't even all in, but God had done a heart change. Yeah. And. It was amazing to see in the, just even the first couple of weeks after that, how God showed up and he started working. It's like he knew I was ready and I got to see God's realness and then I got to see his love through his law. That doesn't, that's almost kind of like a contra controversial thing, yeah. right? Like his law seems contradictory. Like, or, yeah, like an oxymoron. Totally. The law is good because <laughs> the law is like, I can only go that fast on the road. That's messed up. <laughs> but we, the law is good because if we all went as fast as we all wanted to go, we would probably all die sooner in car wrecks, <laughs> right? So the law is good. Yeah, and that's what I got to witness. Is like, wow, uh, just like I did as a kid, and the rules my parents gave me, they did that because they loved me. Yeah. Of course, in that moment as a teenager, it seemed like they hated me and they wanted nothing good for me. Don't yeah. you love me? And like, it seemed like all this. the other kids who had total freedom. It seemed like their parents loved them in our perspective. 
the, look at all the freedom they get. They must love their kids, and they, they have they the must coolest, best parents. Pulls, yeah, but the jealousy, the anger you feel. Uh, but I, I got to see God's love, and then He started to open up doors and provide in really cool ways. That, um, and and one thing that happened shortly after committing my life to Christ is I I got injured in New Zealand. And I did have like a little Bible that I was starting to travel with, but I never read it. I had never read in the Bible. I knew the Bible stories, but there was the Sunday school versions. And when I got injured, injured in New Zealand, I was on this, this beautiful lake. It had a house overlooking it. And I'm like, why would I fly home? So I'm going to spend money to fly home early where I'm just going to sit and be injured there. So why not just sit and be injured here? Yeah. But I didn't really have anything to do. And God put on my heart. I, you know, I like a challenge. <laughs> I just, I, I needed to like kind of bite off more than I can chew, so to speak. And I decided to read the Bible cover to cover. Just like, that where day? do you start? In New Zealand? Is that where you had that? That's where I start. Yeah. In New Zealand, thing. I started reading the Bible cover to cover. And instantly the story started to be like, I know this story, but there's so much more detail. There's things that I was encouraged to read this as a kid. Like these are kind of gnarly things. Like the Bible doesn't hold back. The gnarliness. I mean, there's stuff in that. It's rated R. I yeah, mean, yeah. the head cuttings, the the adultery. The I mean, it shows man's sin. It exposes it, and it also exposed my sin. Hmm. And that moved me to just lay before God and man, feeling just a heaviness, a weightiness to my sin through the Old Testament. And then you get to the New Testament. All of a sudden, you get to see God's love and what He redeemed. And it it that's what transforms you. And these stories that don't seem relevant and they seem impossible and as you're reading through them and you're doing life all of a sudden somehow they start to apply to your life. They actually start to come to life. You know, I, we just came back from more to life and uh, that's a Bible Institute in New York. And I one thing I love about going there is just, it's in their name. Yeah. Word of life and we're you're applying the Bible and its principles and God's word, and you get to see it actually come to life. These BI students are running these camps. They're practicing what they, they're they learning, yep. and they get to see the fruit of it, which is if you're just reading and not put it into uh, like action. To put it into work, put it in action, you're missing out. Yeah. And God's word really is what transformed me. It, it blew me away, the power of it. So I get excited just yeah. going to a place called Word of Life, I get excited to read the Word because I get to see it come to life and put into action. And yeah, it, it's it's unreal. And and man, what a testimony to God's realness in His Word. Because yeah. when you see it come, I mean, this was written over a couple thousand years ago, written over like a four thousand year period, or probably about what is it, twenty five hundred years? That's debatable. I should know the de- well. Yeah, it is debatable, but. Either way, it's either people. way, it's an eternal word of God. You know, his his living word. Yeah, his word became flesh, dwelt among us. I mean, Christ was thought of, believed for before the creation of the world in the time, like before we were born. God knew us. I mean, the the word of God not only shows us that God is supreme and holy mm. and righteous, but He shows us that He's involved in the intricacies of our daily lives, our purpose, our contentment outside of Him. He, the word of God also shows us how we'll be absent of those things, absent of joy, absent of purpose. And so this is why like the storytelling is so important to me because we are a living version of the work of God, the absence of it or the fullness of it. Our story is the more that we can dive into how we're feeling and check ourselves, do an inventory of my life. Do I feel purposeful? Am I driven by a purpose? Am I fulfilled? Am I content? If no, that probably shows me if I'm willing to look and be honest that I'm probably not walking in the fullness of God and his word. I'm probably absent of that. Mm. So when I go to the word and it reveals how those things lead to darkness, those a life without God leads to a life without purpose, it makes sense. And I start saying, God, I need you. Yeah. His word. And then as I live into his word, like you were saying, and put it into action, all of those things come true for me. I mean, God's word and his promises come true. I have the fruit. I have the purpose and the contentment. And as our story is living and changing, when we're in God's word, it shows us the direction to go mm. back to him. I'm falling away. So I'm repenting. I'm coming back to him. And so, yeah, God's word is 
it seems daunting to someone who's never read or never yeah, studied, it but did. it's really it's really not. I mean, I always think small of chunks. The analogy, you know, growing up as a kid, I didn't like fish, and all my friends were starting to go eat sushi, which is raw fish. And to me, there's nothing worse than yeah. eating normal fish than eating raw fish. Like, <laughs> and so I started going out to sushi with my friends, and I ate raw fish, and I'm like, well, that was really good. If I can eat raw fish, I could eat normal. So I started eating fish, and now I love fish. And I and I thought of the Bible as the same thing. I used to hate reading. Yeah. And to me, there was nothing more difficult than reading than reading the Bible, a word written thousands of years ago and, and doesn't apply to today, at least in my mind. That's yeah, what I was in thinking. Your mind, yeah. And then I read God's word, and all of a sudden it's exciting, and it's applicable, and it speaks into my life. Well, I got excited about reading, so I started reading. Yeah, that's I enjoy true. reading, and I'm absorbing knowledge and information through reading. Yeah. Uh, so, well, I mean, God's words transformed you, the man that you are. You know, just the impact that God has through you, the friend that you are to me and to so many other people. I mean, I see the living God expressed through your story. As we go to Word of Life, we've traveled together. Just your love for God, your love for other people, is evident. And for anyone listening, I mean, that should be our goal is to l allow our lives to be a living testimony of who God is. So mm -hmm. he, he's loving and he's kind and he's good and he's humble, even though he's, you know, he came in a manger, right? He's, but he's, he's humble, king. but he's kind of a show off. Exactly. Well, God is such a show off. Sometimes he could have come on a horse, right? <laughs> but he came as a baby in a manger. But at the same time, he puts mud in someone's eyes and heals them. Like that's, that's showing off he's he, yeah god's a show off but yeah he's serving you and washing your feet at the same time like what a contrast right yeah are we and that's a radical life are we living that radical life where we can show yeah. off for god but well paul said i boast all the more in christ so i've said on a few episodes and almost every episode my story is amazing it's not because of anything i've done but as i boast in who god is i should be proud you know <laughs> i should be very proud you yeah. know but at the same time i can say man i'm like humbly like I'm a lost and broken oh, man, man without God's grace. So yep, it is. That's an oxyborn dichotomy. You were kind of mentioning a little bit about just, you're kind of touching on the separation of God. And just when, you know, I think back, tying back into my snowboarding a little bit, you know, that time of freedom where I got to experience the world. Um, I used to talk with God a little bit. You know, I'd pray a little bit. And I'll tell you what, when I just went into the world and was absorbing as much of it as I could, Man, it's like I felt this wall go up between me and God. Like I couldn't even go to him in prayer anymore. And I stopped. I stopped praying to God. I stopped reaching out. You know, and I think especially as a youngster, I was thinking of God as just this like take, take, take thing. Um, and I was missing the blessing of the giving part. But uh, definitely my sin put up a wall between God. I know it, it says our sin, the Bible says sin separates us yeah. from God, that our sin is deserving of punishment and god is a perfect god so if god's perfect he must punish that sin but in a very just real way not only is it punishable but it does i felt that separation yeah and i think a lot of people if they if they step back and look they can see that separation yeah but knowing that there are people struggling who just really want someone to come along and love them yeah because they want to take down the wall but the world's pull on them is very hard. And so you talk about being loved, you know, the world is telling you how to be loved by the world. So you, you kind of put on this fake persona. You, you do these fake things so that the world will love you. So your friends will love you on social media, but yet you, you can't almost be yourself to be loved, which that's a very fake shallow love, right? Where God knows you fully. I mean, I think of a marriage and you spend, why is it so many marriages fail? <laughs> you spend enough time with someone, you can't hide your sin anymore. Yeah. And then it fails, and the love fails. Where God, he knows you more intimately than any possible marriage. He, he created every part of you. He yeah. knows the hairs on your head, uh, or on your body in my case. <laughs> <laughs> Not as much on your head. <laughs> Not as much. It's migrating. And <laughs> still loves you. With a full, like an overwhelming love. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a true love to be fully known, fully loved. Yeah. And there's a, sp even people that don't know God or ever heard anything about Jesus or even love the world, they're still trying to be spiritual. They're trying to find that connection, mm -hmm. whether it's to Mother Nature, 
you know, Mother Earth, whatever they're reaching out to for connection, they recognize their spiritual side. We are very spiritual beings. Yeah, we are. Even those that don't believe in God understand there's a spirituality. And why is that? It's not something you can see, but you feel it. It's something. Well, Ecclesiastes says that God put eternity into our hearts. I think, you know, even our physiology tells us that we were made for something more than the day to day mundane. And people. As they grow older, they start to look up to the skies. They start to feel things that are deep and heavy mm-hmm. and also light and joyful. And they go, man, there's something very amazing about my life. So is self-help books, meditation, you know, singing. You know, a lot of people actually take music and use music as their religion. Yeah. You know, it's like a walk down a path listening to that favorite song that sort of gets you to think Maybe it gets you to actually stop thinking about the stress of your life. Stop thinking about how someone hurt you, how angry you are. And they put on a song that maybe talks about love or talks about getting free or letting go. And they do that. And it works to yeah. a degree, right? It takes them, it takes their mind off of that thing and helps them to just take a step forward. But it's, it is a surface savior, right? It doesn't come down into the core of our soul. Uh, to satisfy us, and only Jesus can do that. Only that story yeah. is. But we we try, and you know, people do try. We were very spiritual, and that's sure. a perspective I kind of keep now. As I'm reading or praying, I'm I'm feeding the spirit, yeah. and knowing that I need to feed my spirit. If I don't, I'm gonna it's gonna come out in other ways. I'm gonna be cruel to my wife. I'm gonna be short tempered with my children. Yeah, I'm gonna be short tempered driving down the road. I need to feed my spirit so that I can have a joy that carries me throughout the day. That's good. Well, uh, I want to go back a little bit, then we'll go back forward again. Take take everybody kind of through your career. Like first off, congratulations, God has given you. It's oh, I know it's over now, but he <laughs> it's gave not you. over. I still get these the, little the, snowboard. Games. Yeah, that's true. Well, you're still ripping on the mountain. Let's <laughs> let's be real. Like doing stuff that I would never do, even if I like. I still like to said. fly. I still like to fly. Yeah, you do, but. Um, I know your career is over, so my saying is congratulations. Look, God gave you an amazing career. What I feel very what was blessed. it like? Just on that the, note, I I mean, there were so many talented snowboarders at the mountain I grew up at, and none of them okay. got to like they would have given anything to have a career in snowboarding, and they didn't get to. But they were extremely supportive, and I always remember that if I ever start to uh, feel jealous or just yeah, kind of wish that your career continued. Yeah, because there are guys that I started with. And I see their careers continuing. I see them still going. Yeah. I'm um, like, man, how is that guy still going? He's still yeah. making money off it. He's still getting to travel around the world. Yeah. Uh, but I do know if I was traveling around the world, it'd be pretty hard to have the closeness with the family that I have now. Yeah. I have two children. I love spending time with them. Yeah. It, it would be devastating to be gone on the road all the time Yeah. with them at home. And it's just, it's hard to have a healthy yeah. family lifestyle that way. Was the Olympics the pinnacle for you of your career, or did you have another one? I would say everyone else besides me, snow Olympics was the pinnacle if they look at my career. I was wondering about that. To yeah. me, it's not the pinnacle. Okay. Um, it was a blessing to be a part of. I'm glad I experienced it. I'm glad I have that title because it helps create a bigger platform. Yeah. Uh, people, I mean, it's a little bit frustrating that that's what it took to really establish my career as legitimate yeah you know like a good example the mountain i grew up at we always as snowboarders we give feedback on how to maybe make the park better or things you could do better and they wouldn't listen to any of us but as soon as i got that olympic title all of a sudden they listened which is a little bit frustrating because the other guys knew just as much as i did but they wouldn't listen to him wow so I mean, there's a shallow. It's funny how the it. world is, right? Yeah, all about titles. Yeah, some some of the biggest titles, like Pinnacle. I mean, X Games. I had a couple of really big years there. Uh, the Arctic Challenge was probably a personal favorite. Were you able to medal in the in X Games? Yeah, yeah, Dude. got a silver in X Games. Um, I didn't. I don't know if I just forgot about that, but that's amazing. Was that half pipe? That was half pipe. Um, won a couple of Arctic challenges. Couple won a couple tours with like the Grand Prix tour, the first year of the TTR tour. Well, as you, you know, still are tied into snowboarding, and all your friends are still competing. Olympics is even coming up. And you have friends there competing again. Um, 
it's it's exciting it kind of gives me some reasons to watch you know just because yeah. you're into it and i'm sure you're excited to watch you know probably you probably wonder like ah oh, i bet i could meddle i bet i could do it <laughs> my mo- i'll tell you this and it was kind of interesting leaving my career um of competitive snowboarding like my mind was still there yeah but my body was breaking and i was starting to run out of spare parts i've had quite a few surgeries <laughs> they keep putting me back together they did a great job but every time they have to like tighten things down a little bit more so that you don't blow it out and yeah um like i want to be able to play with my kids i mean as you see like i can but uh, like you said, it's painful to watch me play yes, with it my is. kids. <laughs> well, I don't feel that pain though. I feel fine. I just it's just hard to grab my board and sometimes tie my shoes. <laughs> yeah. Well, for everyone listening, if you're watching, uh, we'll drop a link in the description below. Um, we'll show the video of of uh, Andy and his testimony. And in that video that we did years ago, you can actually see a lot of the amazing snowboarding that goes on. So it's not it's not just the half pipe. A half pipe is phenomenal to watch but it's the back country big mountain stuff that really blew me away that the stuff is so steep you're getting dropped off on a helicopter and, and falling down a mountain at you know super that's fast where you speed. actually get to surf the mountain I, that's kind of like i have this passion for surfing you're harnessing yeah. this energy that god has sent across this massive ocean in the same way he's put this crazy amount of moisture to glued to the mountain that you get to surf and i mean sometimes you get on these steep faces and you're blown away that you can even slow down or yeah. you can send a 50 foot cliff and land and ride. Away. I mean, it's unreal what you can do in snow. I have a passion for snow, just even building, even shoveling it. All right. Let's, uh, let's circle back, man. Um, one just question is, as you've been watching, this is my story develop over the years. What is, what is it about story in general, like our testimonies and our stories that you would say to somebody you know, my saying at the end of this podcast is always your story matters more than you know. And I would see it somewhat as a crisis. And we're here to encourage people that their story is is phenomenal and that their story is needed and important. So specifically, what could you say that maybe over the years you've seen how your story um, not is not rooted in athleticism or a career or platform, but it's rooted in the Lord. And how would that translate to someone who's listening that never has had or never will have a career in snowboarding? I think a lot of a lot of it comes from the perspective that you have of what your story is and how it's being used and, and the fruit of it. Uh, it's really a command in the Bible to go be a light. And I, think, I believe that's telling the story of what God has done in your life. Because just as the Bible talks about creation in the first chapter of Genesis, mm-hmm. uh, it says, in the beginning, God. It's ultimately about God. It's not about creation. It's it's about God. Same with our story. Our story is about God. It's not about us. I remember as a kid hearing people share their testimony. It was always about almost their sin and, and yeah, yeah. the drugs they were involved in. They had this gnarly story and the transformation of God and what he did. And it's like, well, I don't have a story that cool. Yeah. You know, and it was hard for me. Like, I felt like I had to like stretch to tell my story to, I had to like embellish, embellish it. it. Exactly. Whoa. Whoa jinx. That was weird. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, I, I a hundred percent agree. You know, and, keep going. I'd, I'd like to hear more about this. And I remember starting to hear feedback from kids where a couple times I shared just more than just the natural process of of my story and and how like more chronological it, yeah it it wasn't just overnight it was a process of god oh, yeah. working in my life it took years and just like jim rippy's story is amazing i mean this guy just was transformed overnight and he's radical and he got radical yeah. for jesus overnight yeah. and like my story wasn't that way it was just a slow process but the cool thing is i love sharing how god worked in my life yeah month after month year after year and grew me and I, because my story is not this like crazy drug story, a lot of, I, I see it as more people can relate to it. And the church has portrayed good quote unquote stories. They usually come from something traumatic, something yeah. extreme. So for you to say that yours isn't those things, but yet you've come to realize that it can relate more is really powerful because a lot of times people would say, well, I don't know if I can relate. That insecurity, that fear alone is one of the number one relatable things. Hmm. 
And when we get that moment of, wow, that insecurity, other people feel that. Yeah, (laughs) they do. And when we can grow in that insecurity and have the confidence of God, because we see his story is the most important part of who we are. We're confident. And now people, other people need to hear our story. Amen. Yeah. I rejoice in the simplicity of your story. Rejoice, man. Rejoice. If you have that story that you never fell away from God, that you, you walked with God. And, you know, a lot of times in that type of story, I hear people struggling with pride, like that they were honoring God and they were doing the things, following the commands of God, but then they had to deal with the issue of their pride. And and that speaks to people, people. There are that that's actually almost the rare right now. There might be some people listening that actually say, I have a really amazing story and they're not humble. You touched on something that I think makes people connect more than anything. Okay. And that's the, the humbleness that comes through repentance. If you tell a story from a prideful standpoint, everyone, you're going to turn everyone off immediately. But when you're real with, I think that's one thing about a lot of people's stories that are gnarly that captivates people is that brokenness because they feel a sense of brokenness. Yeah. But when you express that repentance and the healing that came through repentance, all of a sudden there's, there's a draw there. What was it like the first time you sort of opened up about your struggles? What was that like for you? And do you remember a story? I would, because I think people are saying like, all right, I, I'm struggling. I just don't know what to do. I don't know how to take the next step. The first word that comes to mind is freeing. It was okay. freeing to open up about my struggles. And I remember as a, a kid just dealing with, like, only maybe I lied. Maybe I broke a window in the neighbors. And I remember, like, the that just dark tightening and your, tightening feeling. Yeah, yeah just the, the, the weightiness of the sin that you did caused... And, and then the hiding. And then the hiding, how horrible that was. But I remember owning it and getting it out in the open like right after it happened and how freeing it was. Even though there, there might be a consequence. I remember yeah. breaking a window and I had to work for a week to pay $80 to fix this window. But I was free from it. Amen. It couldn't weigh me down anymore. And I think about that like if we find ourselves in a lie or maybe we did something wrong. We're sinners. We still blow it. I still fall short of the glory Amen. of God. And I got to bring it before Christ. But the quicker I bring it to God, the quicker he can free me of it. Yeah. And it doesn't mean I want to go do those things, but just because he will forgive me, but yeah. to be freed of it. So, yeah, run run those things to God. Yeah. Be freed of it. And mm-hmm. the same thing with sharing your story and having a realness. There, there's a freeing. There's a healing side to that. Yeah. It's like digging up old hurts that are you may not realize they're there but when you confess it to someone and ask for forgiveness all of a sudden there can be healing on both sides now that person can forgive you now you can let go of the guilt that you carry and you can forgive one another and move forward in love yeah i would encourage anybody listening to do it if you're struggling you're having a relationship um someone that's broken or you're just struggling individually but it's all sort of hidden and no one knows no one knows you you said earlier, there's nothing better to be known and to be loved. Mm-hmm. And when we're not fully known because we're we're living in fear of what someone might think about us, they may think less of us. They may think um, something shameful. The truth is that God's love is contra-conditional, meaning that, yeah, he already knows we've messed up and it hasn't changed. Even though we are sinners, Christ died for us. That love is is the draw through the spirit to say you know please open up please come to me all who are weary heavy Mm. i will give you rest heal your broken hearts and my encouragement is yeah like you said go to someone and get it out go to the lord first and then confess it repent find freedom don't let a day go by you know a minute an hour call somebody see the lord reconcile because you already know it exists like if you're listening and someone's struggling with something, like when we were struggling, whether it was pornography or anger or bitterness towards someone else, loneliness, it, you felt it. You knew it. You knew that it was harming you. You knew yeah. that you were carrying it. But the harder point was like finding that moment where we would say, I'm going to change the narrative. You're going to take ownership of my story, which means first going to God and then going to someone else. I could say that anytime I walk in obedience in that way, has brought true life Mm. like a life that really is 
better than anything, better than any position in life, better than anything. It's just to, to be free and to be known and loved is the greatest thing on this planet. Amen. Hands down. Yeah. I, think, I think one being kind of interesting to share real quick, just a little bit about uh, letting go of a snowboard career. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was going to ask you that. I think making that transition out of snowboarding when you, that's all you've known, especially from a young age, you've poured your heart into it's. Um, yeah. Well, you are known as a snowboarder, right? It's just everybody that introduces you. It's like Andy, Olympic snowboarder. Well, it's. Yeah, I mean, c competition and, and having sponsors. I mean, that's where my income came from. Yeah. So that's scary to let go of that. Um, you know, it's one thing when you go to college and you have this foundation that you can carry on, but I'm letting go of something that doesn't really have any longevity to it. Maybe you can roll into the industry, but it's a pretty taxing industry. You, It's one of those lifestyle industries where you work in snowboarding for the lifestyle of it, not for the paycheck. You know, as a snowboarder, as a professional snowboarder, you have the potential to get a pretty healthy paycheck, uh, but it doesn't have longevity to it. Yeah. And so when I, really it started with God changing my heart. I felt like I needed to step back from snowboarding. Um, there was a few things that played into it. One was I was starting to have nightmares about snowboarding. When I started, I used to have these amazing dreams where I like hit the first jump in the snowboard park and I just grab and kind of like the video games where you just keep spinning and rotating and then I would just land softly <laughs> in the parking lot and claim oh. it <laughs> and then I, later on I started having nightmares about these snowboard runs Man. I was trying to do in a contest and I'd fall or I'd all of a sudden like I never had good dreams about snowboarding anymore that's one like what is going on mentally that's yeah then you'd actually have to go out and snowboard knowing you just having these nightmares I bet that played into the I don't riding. know. It just, it, it, I could tell there was a heart change where mm. snowboarding had been everything and all of a sudden it wasn't. <laughs> and I was having injuries. And so th those kind of lined up, teed up some of it, but I felt God give me a heart change. And I kept taking it to God those last couple months of my career. Like, God, is this, do I need to keep going? Should I keep going? And the, I'm grateful that I brought it to the Lord because. When the door came kind of slamming shut on my career, I had this peace about it. Uh, it came, I lost all my sponsors kind of the same month, which was caught me off guard because I had seven. I could see losing a couple. Yeah. And there's a few things that kind of teed that up, partly injuries, partly the economy. Uh, there was a change in the garden, snowboarding. Yeah. Uh, but it was around 2008, 2009. Was 2011. Financial collapse. Well, and yeah. then it, it yeah right it continued that. on. 2011 is when I retired. When we met, I think you actually just lost Rip Curl. So that was, I mean, we met like a month, I think, after yeah. it all came slam. But it was amazing seeing that the Lord's hand was in it and the peace it gave me. I was able to let it go without like this tight clenching yeah. grasp on it. Just like, no, like in getting stripped from me. It was not stripped from me. It was... I freely let go of it, which gave me a piece. There's yeah. definitely moments of like, oh, I wish I was still doing that. I miss, yeah. I miss parts of it. Um, got to do some amazing trips and really cool experiences. I'm grateful that I have in those memories. But at the same time, I knew the Lord had something else for me, and I'm really grateful for these new experiences. Amen. I think we're all on a, on a journey for sure. God has blessed us not only with this life that we live, the talents that he's given you, the breath that you breathe, the air that you breathe. Uh, but he has blessed you with a journey that you need to embrace it and enjoy uh, every part of it because you don't know what that day may bring. Yeah. And there's opportunities uh, every single day, one, to give glory to God and to uh, just be a part of a much bigger picture. Because yeah. if you think Andy's snowboard career was a big deal, you're fooling yourself. Yeah, it was not a big deal. It's it's a, I mean Solomon said it right. It it's smoke. It's vanity. It's it's but a fart in the wind. <laughs> it's gone. Wow. We said fart on that podcast. That's pretty cool. My son would be proud. Yeah, <laughs> but our wives would not. You know, I, I'm point. thinking. Um, I'm thinking about that statement you're just talking about. You know, your career going away, but you didn't. You didn't have it ripped from you, but you let it go. Um. 
now I watch you, you know, live into your life and, and how you make your income is not through a big stage, you know, it's through work and through many different ways of, of work to provide your income and, and, um, ministry, you know, sharing your story, sharing the gospel is, is your purpose. And then your family, your family is your story. It's your, where you're at in your life. And, and I hope people can get that picture because, you know, many, many, most people listening are not going to be a professional snowboarder ever. And they also don't have the memories of maybe traveling to foreign countries. I was just talking to somebody the other day. It was like, you have never been out of the country. It'd be amazing to go. And I was like, man, I've been all over the world and it, I've probably taken it for granted, but I do at least have those memories. Um, and I'm thankful for those opportunities, but most people just live a, a quote unquote in the world's mind, a, a mundane life. But this podcast is here to, to help us shake out of that lie because if someone could easily hear this and man, that's an amazing story. Andy's a, a nice guy. It's a great story. And then walk away and literally not look at their story in the same light, in the mm. same manner. What do they need to believe bigger in to shake that off of their belief? I think it starts with one realizing you're a child of God, that he created you unique with a special plate of talents. Like you've been, every single person has been gifted with a personality that's different. I mean, how awesome is that that God didn't just do a cookie cutter, yeah. you know, human body or personality? It is, each one is so different. And I think when we walk with the Lord, I truly believe this, and I tell this to my children all the time, bring it before God. God has given you passions, mm -hmm. and let him use them. Let him use, you want to find fulfillment, you want to find joy, use the gifts, use the place you are in life, and that can be anywhere. I mean, I think about when I go grocery shopping. There's Those are opportunities. God's giving me opportunities to bring joy to people, yeah. which in return fulfills me and brings joy to me. Every day we have opportunities to um, grow our talents and gifts in, in relationships. So we can take the lazy thing where I think one of the most dangerous things is seclusion or I isolation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, when we isolate ourselves, we're taking away one of the biggest gifts that God's given us, and that's community. Yeah. The beauty of snowboarding, wakeboarding, surfing, skateboarding, basketball, NFL, Major League Baseball, it all has the same biblical foundation of belonging. Like, even though you competed individually in snowboarding, there was a family dynamic. Absolutely. And yesterday, we were driving in the car with the kids, going over to the Murrays, you know, to meet up with you guys, and... And Hope was trying to understand the church. Why are we hmm. going to church? And why are, why do we have to go to a it's specific a good question. church? <laughs> it's a great question. And especially during COVID right now, because everyone's starting to stay home and, and view church online. And I said to her, it's like our family. You know, we're driving, but we're not at our house. Are we still a family? They were like, yeah, we're still a family. All right. Where's our house? It's back there. Okay. God says that we are the church. Mm. Well, where is our house? Our house is on Curry Ford at Faith Assembly. It's a house of praise. We don't, we're not, con, you know, confined or defined by the building, nope. but the church is a family. And I love to see that, like, in so many expressions of why, of where people are searching, no matter where it is, one of their biggest longings and desires and what they hope they get out of that thing, whether it's a sport, any sport, a club, any club, golfing club, swimming club, dancing club, or a bar, mm. it all involves belonging. Belonging to someone else, to feel loved, to feel valued. Which is a scary place, right? I mean, people have been hurt in those arenas. All those arenas. Places. Even the church. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of hurt. <laughs> a lot of hurt in the church. Yeah. And you just end up saying, well, I'm going to go and pursue. And why is that? Things. Bunch of sinners. <laughs> sinners. Imperf imperfect people. <laughs> imperfect people. Yeah. I love the, if you ask pastor so often, like, what's the best part about church? The people. What's the worst part about the church? 
the people. Yeah. <laughs> or I say, if you're looking for the perfect church, you know, A, you'll never find it. No. Nope. If you find it, don't go there. You'll screw it up. <laughs> or there's no people there. <laughs> yeah, right. It's only Jesus. But but anyway, yeah, touching on that, which is your your snowboarding career, the family that the family dynamic and and that's why the nucleus family that God's created is is so important in our priorities. And it's where I believe God as a as a husband especially or as a kid, anyone really who has a family, the more we can see that family as valuable to our soul as important um, to bring forgiveness to bring love to have that family be uh, in right standing with one another that is one of the rarest gifts a human can have on this planet today especially with the the percentage of divorce that we have and um, I think it's because that picture is a picture of God now because many people live in a state of brokenness with their nucleus family where this is why it's so important to say, find your identity in God, your father, and find your family, your belonging in the church. Not a building, but in people who genuinely love you, genuinely care for you. They're seeking God together because that family is your support system when you're feeling isolated. Mm. It's your support system when you're not sure what the next decision is about a job, a career, a relationship. That family is bigger and better and more amazing than any sport family well here, family. quick quick evaluation of the church versus the snowboard family yeah. snowboard family we got a bunch of kind of athletic same age group because you can only snowboard that level for yeah, so long no old pro snowboarders and you have a similar passion right so you, a lot of common ground you yeah. go into the church and you have infant to deathbed, the full spectrum. You have the artist, the athlete, the, I mean, all, the doctor. It's it's a full spectrum. Or let's even throw in the hurting, the needy, the homeless. Yeah. Still yeah. in that body of yeah. Christ. Yeah. And what's amazing, having that full spectrum, you also have a full spectrum of gifts, talents. I mean, you talk about a full body. And here's what the miraculous part is the connection that you have with them. You can have amazing friendship commu- and connection with someone that you have no common ground except Jesus. And because Jesus teaches us how to love perfectly, though we still fail at that, though we have that, he teaches us how to teach perfectly, you have a much fuller relationship. Mm. And so the church is just this amazing family to be a part of that will knock your socks off every time. Yeah. I think actually... I would say if you are wondering about your story and your testimony and it doesn't include the church, it's not the full story uh, that Mm. God desires for you to have. Mm. Like it would be impossible because if God is the story, if he is our greatest story, then we have to be involved in the church. We have to love the church. We have to be a part of a body. We cannot have... A, just a brother and sister in Christ relationship because God's story is that very much so he instituted the church. So I think it's a good thing to just wonder and ask yourself as you do an inventory of, am I connecting to the church? In what ways am I being the church? What ways are my gifts being used in the church? And in that, I think as we surrender over and pursue the Lord and say, God, help me find my gifts in the church to serve, that is probably going to be one of the greatest purposes that will a human could find and make even more value in our story. Which you um, just made me think of what part did the church play in my story with mm-hmm. my snowboarding. You're like, yeah, you were off traveling the world, but I still had a pastor at home that was praying for me, yeah, helping me make life decisions. Sierra Bible through, Church. Help me walk through my retirement. Help me walk through the gnarliness of my dad having to shoot out with the police. Yeah, uh, I have a family that's walking through supporting my wife and help babysitting kids because I'm gone and yeah it's amazing it's it's so a huge huge role that i probably need to think about how that does play into my yeah. snowboarding story more uh as it did yeah god really did use that pastor wayne yeah good For, man yeah super yeah wayne hogue he's actually retiring wow uh, this month wow Give from him. from that but he only because he's got other ministry that god's nice. calling him into cool well Man, it's been a great conversation hanging out with you, dude. I know you're going to take off. You've got to go do some 
foiling with Matt Mazzari. Yeah, so. we got to go huck this <laughs> bag of meat here and see what we can pull off. Try you, not to you'll chop do good. There. You'll do fine. See what happens. Don't um, know unless you try. Well, any last words as we part ways here? I can't thank you enough, Kevin, for just the ministry you have. I love hearing the stories that Kevin has. You guys get to join in all his podcasts. And Thanks. Some amazing, uh, just the people that God's bringing in front of you. Um, Daryl Strawberry, loved hearing that story. Yeah. Uh, what yeah, a crazy great, thing. Great Looking conversation. For, yeah, and just the door that God opened that you, I mean, why would Daryl Strawberry have be any interest in talking to Kevin Durham, this, this zero. wakeboarder? Trust me, zero. <laughs> and he just, he was drawn to you, which a lot of people are drawn to Kevin. I mean, he has this. Well, we were standing next to each other at the airport. I don't think, I mean, that was just a total God thing. You know. Which it all is. <laughs> it's all it, is all, yeah. it all is. But in in the gifts that he's given Kevin Durham, he has yeah, given you amazing you. gifts. Yeah, yeah, it's given um, me some some. Amazing I'm excited gifts. to continue continue to listen to these podcasts. I know you're going to be interviewing Jim Rippy here, who's kind of yeah. a, a guy that I looked up to in the snowboard career. This guy was gnarly. He was yep. doing all this early base jumping with his snowboard and he snowmobile and, and gold medalist in the X Games. He was doing the biggest backflips off cliffs. He was snowmobile backflip. He was not, yeah, the yeah. first snowmobile backflip. Um, yeah, I'm doing that podcast today, one or two, I think. Yeah, I can't wait to listen to that. So, thank can't you wait. for having me. Thank you for listening. Um, man, if you have any questions and you want to read, I'm I try to make myself pretty darn accessible. Like, you can reach out, you can call me. It's not that hard to, yeah, to get in contact with me. Um, yeah email whatever email what would that email be uh a1a finch at gmail cool social media as well just social media yeah I, I answer dms on on instagram andy underscore finch cool um yeah that's and you do travel speak at churches occasionally if it you know works out so yeah people are able to reach out to you there and um, we'll drop some links down below for all of those things, but uh, I've, I've enjoyed our conversation, bro. Yeah, Thanks buddy. so much, yeah, and um, you guys, y'all have a blessed day. Thank you for tuning in. It means it means so much that you're joining on on this journey with with all of us as we highlight who God is in our lives. So, pray a blessing over you. Remember, your story matters more than you know. <laughs>
and then still keep up and cross and then to finish where I have enough speed to skim across water. It usually yeah. takes a lot of speed. Yeah. And I'm on skimming across flats. the water on your snowboard. Yeah. While Sean is wakeboarding up off a snow. ramp <laughs> off of snow. Yeah. That was this the whole idea was that summer camp when you're at summer camp and summer's coming to an end, you're looking forward to winter camp. But when you're at winter camp and it's freezing, you can't wait for snow or summer camp. So the crossover. Yeah. So that was neat. That's why you guys were crossing over. 